The next functional appliance that is one of the most used one is the Twinbok. It was developed more than 30 years ago by Clark. It is composed of maxillary and mandibular removable acrylic components. The twin blocks are bite blocks that effectively modify the occlusal inclined plane to induce favorably directed occlusal forces by causing unfunctional mandibular displacement. Upper and lower bite blocks interlock at 45 degrees angle and are designed to full time wear to take advantage of all functional forces applied to the dentition, including the forces of mastication. The occlusal inclined plane is the fundamental functional mechanism of the natural dentition. The twin block appliance has been shown to produce increases in mandibular length as well as variation in lower anterior facial height. The posterior bite blocks of the twin block appliance can be trimmed to facilitate the eruption of the lower posterior teeth in patients with deep bite and accentuated curve of speed. Of course, the blocks can be left untouched to prevent the eruption of the posterior teeth in patients with a tendency toward an anterior open bite and increased lower vertical height. Because the twin block is composed of two parts, speaking usually is not a problem. The duration of treatment is 9 to 12 months followed by nighttime wear. Phase 2 treatment with fixed appliances is usually begun after the transition to the permanent dentition is complete. This is a patient uh, at the age of 10 that I started uh, with the twin book as a first phase of treatment. Uh, his upper arch needed some expansion. In the lower, uh, he has hypodontia of the central incisors and the lower right second premolar. So uh, I started with expansion and some mesial movement of the mandible. He has a convex profile and a really narrow uh, upper arch and protruding upper incisors. Uh, from the panoramic x-ray, you can see that uh, he has germs of the third mowers in the mandible and you can see the missing uh, central incisors and uh, the premolar. From the cephalogram, you can see that he is a skeletal class 2 with protrusive, protrusive upper incisors and hyperdivergent type of growth. So this is how the twin box looks like in the mouth. He wears it full time uh, without uh, meals. So this is after nine months of treatment. Uh, we reached almost class one in the mowers. His lower canines are erupting uh, distally. Uh, and I think the overbite is pretty nice. And uh, Oh, we managed to incline palatal the upper incisors. These are the extra oral changes for this period of treatment of nine months, and uh, especially in the lips and, and the profile. And in these pictures, you can compare before and after the treatment with the twin block, the wider smile, the inclination of the incisors and the change in the profile. And this is another really nice patient at the age of eight with uh, lower lip sucking. He uh, has protrusion of the upper incisors, convex profile, uh, Hyper, uh, hyperactive mentalis muscle. He didn't like his look and his smile. He's a really intelligent boy. I started the treatment with a twin block and this is how the occlusion look like, looks like at the beginning of treatment. He was, re he was really motivated. The cephalogram shows a, near, a really uh, severe skeletal class 2, 9 degrees, Fango AMB, 8 millimeters of AOBO, normal divergent type of growth, uh, some protrusion of the upper incisors and some of the lower incisors.
you can see on the first panoramic x-ray that he has a mesiodense that uh, he has been developing uh, upside down. He extracted the mesiodense, and this is the progress on the, uh, on the panoramic x-ray. This is his smile and uh, the profile after wearing uh, the twin book for almost a, a year. And the changes in the occlusion, we are almost in quad one, uh, but the bite is still deep. And at this moment, we switched to a prefabricated uh, myofun myofunctional appliance, a trainer, uh, that gives us some effects uh, at the same time, retrusion of the upper incisors, uh, protrusion at the beginning of the lower incisors, extrusion of the mowers and the premowers, and also uh, a very important thing, intrusion of the incisors. Especially when the patient is wearing these appliances uh, during daytime, at least two hours per day, with the appropriate uh, myofunctional uh, exercise. And this is uh, his smile and his profile uh, after one year with uh, this appliance. And uh, the changes and the development of the arches. You can see that the incisors are not so vestibular inclined and are perfectly aligned. The cephalogram proves the skeletal and dental velar changes that we achieved for this time. During this time, uh, angle AMB is from 9 to 5 degrees, AOBO is from 8 to 3.5 millimeters, and the lower incisors are with the same inclination, and we get some retrusion of the upper incisors. And the difference in the occlusion before and after. I think that the treatment with fixed orthodontic appliances afterwards will be really easy and short term. The Herbst appliance is a fixed appliance that can be used for treatment of class 2 mild occlusions in permanent dentition. The original bite jumping mechanism was developed by Herbst. Both skeletal and dental alveolar adaptations are produced. About 50% of the treatment effect is due to tooth movement, primarily the backward and upward movement of the posterior maxillary dentition. The skeletal treatment effect produced is a short-term increase in the mandibular growth. Herbst appliance is not the appliance of choice in mixed dentition patients because years after Herbst therapy was completed and before the placement of the fixed appliances, a tendency toward the relapse to the original mouth occlusion have been noted. The appliance doesn't have a direct effect on the orofacial musculature and the shape of the deciduous teeth doesn't provide the same type of occlusal interdigitation as in the permanent dentition. We can use class 2 elastics for correction of dental and skeletal class 2 occlusion as an anchorage in the upper jaw, for space closure in extraction cases and door control of the incisors, and for retraction of the upper incisors. The dental alveolar effects of the class 2 elastics are distalization of upper posterior teeth, extrusion, mesial inclination, and rotation of the lower first mower mesialization of lower posterior teeth and vestibular inclination of the lower incisors. And the skeletal effects are stimulating the mandibular growth, clockwise rotation of the mandible and increase of lower facial height, and backwards rotation of the occlusal plane. This is a girl at the age of 10 that she came to my office uh, because she thought she was ugly because of her severely protruding upper incisors. She has upper midline shift to the left, uh, class 2 on one side and class 1 on the other side, increased over jet and uh, some problems with the eruption of the upper left posterior teeth. 
On the panoramic X-ray, uh, you can see the mesial inclination of upper left canine and two premolars. The canine goes over the lateral incisor. I decided uh, to extract uh, these three primary teeth, primary canine and the two primary molars. Uh, from the cephalogram, we can see that uh, she is skeletal class one with uh, hyperdivergent type of growth and really severely protruding upper incisors. I started the treatment with a transpalatal arch, uh, trying to keep uh, the leeway space after extraction, the upper left primary teeth. Uh, so I managed to guide uh, the normal eruption of the upper left canine and the two premolars. After that, I continued with fixed orthodontic appliances and uh, she used to wear class 2 elastics uh, in order to retract the upper incisors without uh, losing the anchorage of the posterior teeth. And uh, these are the extra oral photographs uh, at the end of treatment, the changes in the smile, uh, in, the, in the profile. She was really very happy because she didn't like her anterior teeth at all. The pictures are from the day of debonding. Nice, overbite, no overjet, class one, both sides. This is the final panoramic X-ray. I saw her two weeks ago, and this is her smile two years in retention. and the occlusion. You can see the changes in the smile and in the profile from the beginning of treatment and two years post-retention. Before and after. Correction of the skeletal discrepancy can be best accomplished during periods of active growth. Early treatment concept suggests that correction of skeletal discrepancies is as effective in pre-adolescent years as during adolescence. The adolescent growth spurt in the mandible occurs in less than 25% of cases, but the presence, onset, duration, and magnitude of the pubertal growth spurt in facial dimensions cannot be accurately predicted for any single individual. In the presence of significant skeletal discrepancies, treatment should not be postponed. There is greater cooperation in younger ages than in adolescents in wearing extra or functional appliances. Some authors recommend two-stage treatment approach. The objectives of the first stage are the early correction of the incisor flaring, the mole relationship and the crossbite if present, followed by a period of retention. Treatment is completed in the second stage after the eruption of the permanent dentition. The early molar and crossbite correction considerably simplifies treatment in the second stage, while the maxillary incisor retraction minimizes the danger of a traumatic injury and improves abnormal lip position. With mild to moderate dental or skeletal discrepancies, treatment could be postponed until the late mixed or early permanent dentition stages. With more severe discrepancies, treatment can be started as early as possible. Skeletal class 2 problems are due to mandibular deficiency in two-thirds of cases or downward backward rotation of the mandible caused by excessive vertical growth of the maxilla in one-third of the cases. For non-growing patients with skeletal class 2 malocclusions, there are only two possible treatment approaches. The first one is the orthodontic camouflage based on retraction of the protruding maxillary incisors to improve both dental occlusion and facial aesthetics without correcting the underlying skeletal problem, and the orthognatic surgery to reposition the mandible or the maxilla. The ideal patient for camouflage should have reasonably good facial aesthetics initially, with overjet created more by maxillary incisor protrusion than mandibular retrusion. The more severe the mandibular deficiency and the greater the overjet, the greater the need for surgery to obtain satisfactory clinical correction. With surgical treatment, the focus was advancement of the mandible to correct the mandibular deficiency, not retraction of maxillary incisors to camouflage it. 
Mandibular advancement surgery alone is used for patients who have normal or short anterior face height initially. Long face class 2 patients receive a combination of superior repositioning of the maxilla and mandibular advancement. A consistent improvement of the profile of the patient after surgery was only seen in patients with a pretreatment A and B angle more or equal to 6 degrees. It is very important to decide from the beginning if we go for surgery or for camouflage treatment because we need different extraction protocols. With orthodontic treatment alone, a patient with mandibular deficiency and a class 2 malocclusion may have upper first premolar removed in order to gain space for the retraction of the maxillary anterior teeth. Extraction in the lower arch should be avoided or if necessary because of leveling or alignment requirements, the second premolars may be chosen to provide needed arch length while avoiding retraction of the lower anterior teeth. The extraction pattern the same patient will be quite different if mandibular advancement is planned. The aim of the orth orthodontic treatment in this case will be removal of the dental compensation prior to surgical correction of the jaw relationship. Premolar extractions in the lower arch but not in the upper often is needed. Usually the lower first premolars are removed in order to gain enough space for leveling of the arch and for correction of the lower anterior proclination often as associated with this malocclusion. The upper arch will be treated without extraction or if some space is needed because of arch length discrepancy, extractions of upper second premolar should be planned to avoid compromising the mandibular advancement by over retraction of the upper anterior teeth. And the last patient is a man at the age of 26 that decided to go for orthognatic surgery with uh, highly express expressed convex profile. This is his occlusion, increased overjet, protrusion of the upper incisors, uh, deep overbite. The cephalometric measurements prove that uh, he is a skeletal class 2, angle AMB 7.3 degrees, uh, the width appraisal is 8.6 millimeters. Uh, he is with hypodivergent type of growth and uh, protrusion of the upper and the lower incisors. These are the photographs uh, uh, after the decompensation of the malocclusion uh, before the orthognatic surgery. And this is the final result. He is happy with his new smile and uh, new profile. And we end up with skeletal class 1, A and B angle 3.6, the width appraisal is 2.6 millimeters, and normal inclination of the upper incisors and slight vestibular inclination of the lower. And the comparison before and after, the big change in the profile and the smile. The conclusion of all the information that you have already seen and heard is that the treatment results in patients with class 2 malocclusions are influenced by many factors. The first one is the etiology of the malocclusion. For example, the presence of different deleterious oral habits, the severity of the malocclusion, the individual variability, the growth potential of the patient, the patient cooperation, the biomechanics used, and the retention protocol. And these changes that you can see in the profile of this girl from 5 to 13 years of age make me a big fan of the interceptive treatment and the myofunctional appliances. Thank you for your attention.